Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Ed Gein case. Ed Gein was a serial killer who was the inspiration for a number of famous fictional characters, including Norman Bates from the 1960 movie Psycho, Buffalo Bill from the 1991 movie The Silence of the Lambs, and Leatherface from the 1974 film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at Ed Gein's background, then the timeline of the crimes, the court proceedings, and then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Ed Gein was born on August 27, 1906 in La Crosse, Wisconsin. His father, George, had difficulty regulating his intake of alcohol and worked various jobs. Eventually, Ed's mother, Augusta, decided to move the family to a farm. Ed spent a lot of time on that farm, only leaving to go to school. Augusta ran a grocery business, and she was the primary source of financial support for the family. She was described as having fanatically religious beliefs. She used to read passages from the Bible about homicide and death in general to Ed and his older brother, Henry. She also had an extremely negative view of women. Augusta was very controlling, regulating who Ed could talk to and where he could go. Ed Gein's performance in school was within normal range, but he did do well in reading. He was shy, he would sometimes inappropriately laugh, and he was picked on by the other students because he had a growth on his left eyelid that impaired his vision. When he would come home upset because of the bullying, George would beat him. Ed may have sustained head injuries from these incidents, but it's not really clear. He said that when George would attack him, his ears would ring afterward. So we don't really know exactly what was happening, but either way, that was a fairly severe attack. Gein would drop out of school in the eighth grade. His father, George, would die due to his alcohol consumption in 1940 at age 66, which led Ed Gein and Henry to take a more active role in producing income. They earned a good reputation as handymen in the local community. Gein also worked as a babysitter and felt as though he got along with children much better than he did with adults. Henry became increasingly concerned about how close Gein was with Augusta. He also criticized Augusta, which did not sit well with Gein. In May 1944, Ed Gein and Henry were working on the farm, and they had set fire to burn vegetation. The fire grew too large, and the fire department responded. After the fire was put out, Ed Gein indicated that Henry was missing, yet he was able to lead the authorities directly to Henry's body. Henry had bruises on his head, but asphyxiation was recorded as the cause of death. The authorities believed that Henry was breathing in the smoke from the fire, and that's what killed him. Some did suspect that Ed Gein had killed Henry, but he was not charged with that crime. Gein developed an interest in books about grave robbing, human anatomy, and a few other topics that were disturbing to Augusta. In December 1945, Augusta died as a result of a stroke. Gein was particularly close to his mother, and his level of distress in reaction to her death was commensurate with his level of attachment. He used boards to block off certain rooms in the house that his mother had used, and he stayed in a utility room next to the kitchen that he converted into a bedroom. Even though the rooms he blocked off stayed clean, the rest of the house became very dirty and disorganized. Ed Gein remained on the farm, occasionally working as a handyman, and surprisingly, he was still getting babysitting jobs. Now moving to the timeline of the crimes. November 16, 1957. A local hardware store operator named Bernice Warden disappeared. The hardware store's truck had been seen driving from the rear of the building at about 9.30 a.m., and the store was closed that entire day. A deputy sheriff, who happened to be Warden's son, went to the store at around 5 p.m. and found bloodstains on the floor, and he noticed the cash register was open. Ed Gein had been in the store the night before Warden went missing and the morning she went missing. The police searched Gein's farm and found Warden's body. She had been shot with a 22 caliber rifle, and her body was decapitated. Many other remains were found as well, including those of Mary Hogan, another woman who had disappeared. 
the police found a number of body parts and items made from those parts. For example, masks made from human heads, chairs covered in human skin, bowls made from skulls, and a lampshade made from a human face. Ed revealed that he had made numerous visits to local graveyards from 1947 to 1952 and exhumed bodies while in some type of daze. The first body he dug up was that of his mother. He took her head back to his house. On several occasions, Gein used the obituaries to identify recently deceased women who looked like his mother, and he would go and dig up their bodies. He then tanned the skins and made different items. Later, he would say that he had strange visions during this time, which of course could have been hallucinations. He said he was trying to build a suit out of women so that he could transform himself into his mother. Gein claimed that seeing the bodies led to sexual gratification, but he did not actually have sex with the bodies because they smelled too bad. He also confessed to the murder of Mary Hogan, but later he would pretend that he didn't remember what happened. Gein was also a suspect in several other murders. Now moving to the court proceedings. When Gein was being questioned by the police, one of the police officers rammed his head into a brick wall. Because of this, his confession was ruled inadmissible. In 1957, Gein pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to one count of first-degree murder, but he was found mentally incompetent after being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So we see here that even though the confession was ruled as inadmissible, the police had other evidence. After his plea, he was sent to a maximum security mental health facility in Wisconsin. In 1968, mental health professionals decided that Gein was now mentally competent, and he was tried in November of that year. Gein had told a mental health professional who testified at the trial that he was looking at a firearm in Warren's store, and he attempted to load a cartridge into the weapon when the weapon accidentally discharged and killed Warden. He didn't remember anything else that occurred on the morning of her death. Ed Gein elected to have his trial by judge instead of by jury. The judge found him guilty, and a second trial began to determine if Ed Gein was insane or sane. After that trial was over, the judge ruled that Ed Gein was not guilty by reason of insanity. Gein would be committed to a mental health hospital. He filed a petition to be released in 1974, but that petition was rejected. Gein would die on July 26, 1984, he was 77 years old. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. During Gein's time in the mental hospital, after he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, he was reported to be a model patient. The staff never had to use medications to sedate him. He didn't break the rules. He took an interest in different crafts, like rug making and stone polishing. I hope they restricted what material he was allowed to use when he made those crafts. I also hope they didn't let him teach other patients how to make crafts like the Ed Gein Crafts with Cadavers Hour or something like that. I would imagine that if someone visited a patient in that facility, like a patient who was related to them, just the fact that they would know that their relative was in contact with Ed Gein would make them refuse all the gifts that their relative might offer to them. Like the patient would say, hey, I made you this cup. And the visitor would say, you know what? You hold on to that. I don't need any more household items of any type ever, right? That would be the end of it. They wouldn't want to take anything out of that facility. Now going back to Gein's behavior in the facility, other than staring at nurses and other female staff, the people at that facility had difficulty viewing Gein as mentally ill. So again, he was a model patient. He didn't cause any trouble when he was in the facility. Let's take a quick look at his potential personality profile. I use the five-factor model to conceptualize personality. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So with openness to experience, his level would be high. He was intellectually curious, even though he didn't really stand out in school. School has a social component to it that he really didn't adequately achieve. I suppose one could also make the argument that he had an appreciation for art, although I don't think what he created actually qualifies as art, although technically it does speak to his creativity, I suppose. In terms of conscientiousness, his level was probably mid-level, he worked around the community. Everybody liked him. He seemed responsible for the most part. He worked hard to make all those items in his house. Again, that was certainly negative behavior, but it does technically speak to conscientiousness. As far as extroversion, his level was fairly low. He was not outgoing or talkative, not particularly friendly, although not unfriendly either. He was not assertive, and for the most part, he was not sensation-seeking. 
As far as agreeableness, his level would be low. Prior to his criminal career, he was generally compliant with rules, but we see that he was not straightforward, altruistic, or empathic. So some of his facets may have been higher on agreeableness, but many would be quite low. As far as neuroticism, his level was high. He did appear to be somewhat depressed and anxious, and he had difficulty resisting temptation. As I mentioned, it was determined that he had schizophrenia, which would explain his delusions and hallucinations. It would also explain the inappropriate laughter, which is somewhat common with this disorder. It is also believed that Gein had a number of paraphilias. Ed Gein is quite unusual among serial killers. There does seem to be a sexual component to his crimes, but his motivation really doesn't seem to be about domination, revenge, or control, but rather a desire to recreate his mother or become his mother. Many serial killers have interacted in various ways with bodies of their victims, and Ed Gein did this as well, but he also retrieved bodies from graveyards. So he was not responsible for the deaths of those victims, rather his crimes were committed post-mortem. Why did Ed Gein become a serial killer? Well, we don't know for sure, but I think it's due to a combination of a number of factors. Gein did not have any meaningful relationships with women. His mother was the only woman he regularly interacted with, and that relationship was highly dysfunctional. She controlled him and shaped his beliefs to an extreme degree. Some of these beliefs were delusional, and Ed appeared to be predisposed to invest in and to add to delusions. Ed Gein fantasized about women, and he was amazed by the power he believed they had over men. He didn't know how to relate to women, and I think he probably felt conflicted. He was attracted to them, but he was also concerned about his mother's warnings about women. This led him with no safe way to interact with women. He was fascinated by morbid topics like death, preserving body parts, and using them to create various items. His mother's death deprived him of all structure. We see again when he was in the mental hospital in that highly structured environment, he did very well. But without structure, Ed was like a rocket without fins. His mother regulated his behavior his entire life, and without her, he had no way to manage his mood. She made him dependent on her, so dependent that her death was inconceivable to him. Under this stress, he connected the fact that he missed his mother with his morbid beliefs, which gave rise to this delusion where he could transform into her. He acted on this delusion over the course of several years. It is believed he killed at least five victims, although we can only be sure about two, Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan. Ed Gein's delusion, this idea that he could make a suit, wear it, and then become his mother, is really quite unusual. When we think of delusions that are related to schizophrenia or other disorders tied to psychosis, like delusional disorder, the delusions usually fit into a subtype. For example, grandiose, erotomanic, religious, persecutory, or jealous. But Gein's delusions don't really seem to fit into any of those categories. As a matter of fact, what he believed doesn't seem to fit in any category at all. The closest category of delusions that are tied to Gein's beliefs would be a rare type called a delusion of misidentification. Even this type doesn't match too well, but it may help to understand his delusion a little bit. This type of delusion involves an incorrect belief about the identity of other people, oneself, animals, objects, or places. All the delusions in this category have two common elements, a misidentified entity and an incorrect belief about the identity of that entity. So simply misidentifying somebody else isn't normally thought of as enough to qualify as this delusion. Here are a few subtypes of this delusion. Mirrored self, misidentification, someone looks in the mirror and fails to recognize their reflection. They may think the person in the mirror is someone else, or they might not recognize them at all. We have the free goalie delusion. This is when they believe that a person who they do not know, a stranger, is in fact a known person who is wearing a disguise. We have the Copgrass delusion. This one is actually one of the more common delusions of misidentification. This is when somebody misidentifies other people. Typically, a person with this delusion misidentifies people who are close to them. For example, we often see situations with a spouse believing that their spouse has been taken over by an imposter. In most cases, multiple people are thought to be imposters, but somebody can have this delusion where there is only one 
misidentification. Now, in looking at those three types of the delusion of misidentification, none of them really seem to line up with what Ed Gein believed. But then we look at a couple of other delusions of misidentification, and they seem to be getting close. The two that I think get a little bit closer are intermetamorphosis and reduplicative paranesia. So looking at intermetamorphosis, this is a belief that an individual has been transformed internally and externally into another person so that the original person is gone. Now, there's also a reverse intermetamorphosis, and I think this one gets even closer. The person believes that they have transformed into somebody else. Now, the other one I mentioned was reduplicative paramnesia. This is a belief that a person or object has been duplicated. With this delusion, there is no sense that the duplicate is an imposter. So, there's simply a duplicate. Nothing evil or nefarious is going on. That copy of the person is just roaming around and interacting with various people, working, and living life. It's not unusual that people with this delusion also believe that places and objects have been duplicated. So, kind of looking at all this, in one way, Ed Gein may have had something similar to reduplicative paramnesia, where he believed that other women who look like his mother were sort of like duplicates. Not exactly, but they were close enough to where he could essentially invest in another delusion like intermetamorphosis, which led him to believe that he could transform into somebody else. So in a way, he put everything together and came up with this plan that he attempted to carry out. This is an unusual case that's difficult to classify. It's not surprising that it has led to all these fictional characters. Those are my thoughts on Ed Gein. Please put any thoughts or opinions in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.